So this is joint work with uh, Martin, Martin Kohl and Thies Larakam. And um, so, um, <clears throat> so I work over C. So I consider a smooth projective surface with a geometric genus positive. So with a holomorphic two form and first cohomology uh, with Z coefficient zero that H be an ample line bundle on S, then we can look at the modelized space, uh, which I call M uh, RC1, C2 of rank R H semi-stable sheets on S with strange classes C1, C2. You know, I have uh, uh, called the definition of stable and semi-stable as it was in uh, Thomas lecture. And um, for simplicity, I will usually assume that stable is equal to semi-stable. Um, so then this modelized space is projective, it will be usually quite singular, but it has a, uh, a certain expected dimension, which is the, uh, <coughs> uh, which I denote by VD or VD of RC1, C2 through, throughout the whole talk. So 2RC2 minus R minus 1, C1 squared minus R squared minus 1, the holomorphic Euler characteristic of S. So <coughs> now, Waffer in Britain, in 1994, in their uh, famous paper, uh, Strong Coupling Test of s duality gave, in some sense, an explicit conjectural formula for the generating function of the Euler numbers of modular spaces say, in rank two in terms of modular forms. This is not quite true. For one thing, it's maybe not precisely the Euler number. And secondly, it is more general. It, it all, this generating function also computes uh, other invariants. And uh, these invariants uh, are now called the waffer witten invariants, and they have now recently been uh, math given a mathematical definition by Tanaka and Thomas in terms of modular spaces of Higgs pairs. So I think uh, Richard hasn't yet talked about it, but uh, he maybe will tomorrow. <coughs> so <coughs> let me then briefly recall what these are. So let SH be a projective surface with an ample divisor. Higgs pair on S is a pair of a torsion free sheaf uh, on S, which is called E, uh, E on S, and uh, a homomorphism from E to E tensor Ks, uh, which is trace free. And, I, uh, and there's a stability condition, which I don't uh, uh, tell you. And uh, then this N uh, equal to N S H R C 1 C 2 is the modelized space of these R stable Higgs pairs. <laughs> so, uh, so here it's written again. <clears throat> so this is just a pair of a, of a sheaf and the homomorphism of the sheaf from, from, from the sheaf to the sheaf tensor Ks. So, <clears throat> so uh, this modelized space admits what is called a symmetric obstruction theory. So we have tangent space and obstruction space, which are dual to each other. You have the virtual tangent bundle. <clears throat> um, and so this also means it has expected dimension zero. And so you expect to get a number by integrating uh, the class one over its virtual fundamental class. Now, this doesn't quite work because n is not compact. So one cannot really say what that's supposed to mean. But so it's compact, but it has an action by C star just by rescaling uh, this phi from E to E tensor Ks. So this phi is called uh, the Higgs field. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm always moving this, this thing uh, to where I want to show you. Can you see it? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, <clears throat> and so it has the C star action and the, the fixed point locus is compact. And then uh, they decide to just define the invariance uh, using this. Namely, if n was compact, then one could uh, 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 compute this integral of, of one over the virtual fundamental class by, by virtual localization. And the formula would be this, you sum over the, uh, you integrate over the fixed point locus, one over the virtual normal bundle of the fixed point locus. So the virtual normal bundle of the, uh, is the part of the virtual tangent bundle where the action of, uh, of this C star is non-trivial. So if it was compact, then this would be the formula, how you compute this. Now, as this is not compact, this is a priori not defined. So you use the uh, 
right hand side to define the left hand side. And so that's what they do. And so in this way, they say what it means to what the number associated to this modelized space is, namely formally integration of one over the modelized space given by this local virtual localization. So this will only give you a rational number because uh, you, know, you have uh, done this trick. Okay. <clears throat> So now one can say a few more about these modelized spaces. So the fixed point locus, locus has a decomposition into, well, unions of connected components. And these unions of connected components are parametrized by partitions of the rank R. We look at sheets of rank R and we look at this. Namely, <coughs> um, uh, the piece corresponding to a partition lambda, where lambda is equal to you know, whatever, lambda one to uh, lambda k, and it parameterizes pairs A phi, where E decomposes as a direct sum of vector bundles, where the rank of the vector bundle is lambda i, the ith part of the partition, and the phi only maps from E i to E i minus, you know, always maps E i to E i minus one. So in particular, and uh, so, and then, so the last one, see, E1 just maps, uh, is the zero map to zero, okay? Um, <clears throat> so um, so this is gives us a decomposition. What? what? So this gives us uh, the decomposition onto, of this fixed point locus. And so we have two distinguished one. One is uh, one uh, component okay. uh, is the, the one corresponding to the trivial partition, which just consists of the number R. So it means E, we have E of rank R and phi just uh, is the zero map. And in this case, if phi is the zero map, it means we, we don't have a pair of coherent sheaf and uh, such a homomorphism, we just have the coherent sheaf. So it turns out that this modelized space, uh, this part of the modelized space is just the modelized space of stable sheaves. And we have also the vertical component where uh, the sheaf uh, decomposes into a direct sum of uh, sheets of rank one. And then always one goes to the next. Okay, so these are, and then there are others corresponding to other partitions. Lothar, we have a question uh -huh. in the Q&A. Does this mean partitions need not to be descending? No, I think, I mean, yeah, I, <clears throat> no, I don't. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think the partitions should be descending, but you know, I hope I'm not making a mistake and have it the wrong way around, but I think that the partitions have to be descending, but uh, okay. Anyway, this, uh, <laughs> um, I think it should be okay as is. I mean, okay. Um, so now, uh, um, <clears throat> now we can make a partition function out of this uh, this whole thing. We sum up over all these parts. How does one make this more? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> so we make a generating function of this. So we sum q to the virtual dimension corresponding to R C one C two for the normal modelized space divided by two R, and some trivial prefactor, which serves to, in the end, get modular forms. And um, then we, we have this thing that we had defined uh, the integral of one over the moduli space, and we have this sign. So we take this uh, generating function like this in Q, which gives us all these numbers. Um, this is the buffer bitten partition function. Now, what? Now, by definition, this splits into a smaller partition function, one corresponding to every uh, partition lambda. Because for a partition lambda, we just look at the contribution of uh, the parts of the C star uh, uh, fixed point locus, where, um, you know, because after all, this integral of one over this thing was defined in terms of doing something on the fixed point locus, which is decomposed into, um, in, into pieces parameterized by partitions. So we can just sum up uh, the terms corresponding to a certain partition. This gives us the partition function for lambda. And uh, we, so we can write it like this. <clears throat> so this uh, is just the sum over all lambda of the partition function corresponding to lambda. And so, um, okay. And so, it <clears throat> okay.
Okay, so now let's look in particular. What is the, what is the reason to divide by R in this partition function? Well, I think the point is, uh, I mean, it's all just somehow aesthetic thing, but uh, um, okay. I mean, it somehow is, is nicer if one <laughs> divides by R. It maybe also corresponds to uh, somehow to the, uh, some kind of physics thing, but by itself, you know, it doesn't have a big meat, but uh, it somehow uh, uh, needs to slightly nicer formulas, but uh, I don't think it is of any real importance. The powers of Q are to do, uh, have to do with the fact that one finally wants to get something modular, but uh, the R is, uh, I think, not so important. Um, now, we can in particular again look back at the modular space of sheaves. So this also carries a perfect obstruction theory, but now not a symmetric obstruction theory. This um, perfect obstruction was defined by Mochizuki and its virtual dimension is precisely the virtual dimension I get at the beginning. And so it also has a virtual um, tangent bundle and a virtual fundamental class, um, which lies in the correct dimension, uh, chow, chow group of the correct dimension of the modelized space. And then one can also define the virtual Euler number of this modelized space by just integrating the correct uh, churn class of the virtual tangent bundle over the virtual uh, fundamental class. And Tanaka Thomas proved that indeed uh, the virtual Euler number of the modelized space is equal up to sine to uh, the uh, to the invariant that was defined by virtual localization for this the corresponding uh, component of the uh, moduli space uh, of uh, Higgs pairs. Okay, so everything is compatible. Um, and so, therefore, if I take the part of the partition function, uh, maybe except that I forgot this r to the minus one, the part of the uh, partition function which corresponds to, ah, here, this is obviously q to this power, um, uh, which corresponds to uh, to the partition, to two partition r, is just a generating function of the Euler numbers of the molar spaces of sheaves. So in particular, the waffer witten partition function contains as part of it the generating functions of the virtual Euler numbers of the molar space of stable sheaves. So which in case, for instance, the modular space happens to be non-singular is equal to the actual order. Okay. So there's also the, the title. So is, are there questions? So um, are there questions? Um, so uh, the, the title of this paper there, there by- a, Yeah. Sorry, Lothar, there is a question in the Q and A. Is the left hand side in the result of TT computed using the Berenf function? No. Which one? Where now? The right hand side is. Uh, no, no, they, it doesn't work with the Berenf function. No. So that is, I think, something that uh, Tanaka and Thomas found, found out. If you try instead to compute with the Berenf function, you get the wrong result. You really have to do this. Uh, this virtual localization, this formal virtual localization, this gives you a different result from what you would get uh, with the Behrend function, and somehow the, what you get with the Behrend function is not a, is not good numbers. In particular, it doesn't match uh, things you get from other sources. So I mean that uh, Thomas explained once in a talk, <clears throat> uh, uh, which I listened to. Okay. So is the so, interpretation of Q. Uh, uh, like an intrinsic interpretation of Q besides that you want to get something modular? Well, it just, it, it, I don't really know what that uh, would mean. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, I mean, at least I don't think I have such an interpretation. I don't know precisely what, uh, how one could do that. Uh, I mean, like this, it just counts the basically that the dimension of the modelized spaces. So you you kind of, uh, in some sense, you basically have a generating function in C two. Or why would you in, expect it to be modular? What? Why would you expect it to be modular? I wouldn't expect uh, anything like that to be modular, but um, the physicist expected to be modular. This is called S duality, and it has something to do with uh, that. Uh, this has something to do with gauge theory, and you replace uh, magnetic fluxes or uh, magnetic things with, uh, with electric things and this gives you this but I don't know what it means. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't think there's a good mathematical reason why it should be well 
there are maybe some reasons, but a priori, there's no reason to expect it. And I mean, whatever, maybe somebody else can say something better, but uh, um, you know, there's, um, you, you know, you can relate it to something with the instant on partition function since you can see something is modular for some other reason, but it's not so, ah, I can say one thing uh, to this question. So one, you have two things here. For one thing, in the case of K3 surfaces, you can compute all these things rather easily and you get always something which is related to the Dirichlet, uh, to the to the Dedekind, no, to the delta function, to the delta modular form. And you also have the blow up formula, which tells you what happens if you blow up your surface in a point. And this is somehow can be expressed in terms of theta functions. So the, in, at least here you have two instances where you have uh, modular forms. And at least the theta functions you can see somehow directly by looking at the wall crossing that uh, you would get that. But I don't know, that's not a deep reason, it's just uh, how it comes to pass in, if one looks at it uh, in a naive way. <clears throat> okay, so um, now let me look at this. Uh, so I wanted to briefly talk about s -duality. First, I uh, recall uh, modular forms. So maybe people know what modular forms are. Uh, so maybe you just write it here. So we have, that's a holomorphic function from the complex upper half plane to the complex numbers, um, which is, uh, has this uh, transforms in this way under the action of SL2Z. So F of A tau plus B divided by C tau plus B is C tau plus D to the K times F of tau, this is a modular form of weight K. And you have uh, two generators, which is T, uh, like this, which sends tau to tau plus one and s, which is the more interesting one, uh, which gives sends tau to minus one over tau. And uh, <clears throat> furthermore, you have this property that uh, a modular form should always have a, a Q development like this. You can write it as a power series with only positive and non negative degrees a and q to the n, where q is e to the two pi i tau. Um, and a modular function will be a quotient of two modular forms of the same weight, uh, which also means that it's invariant in that of sl 2 z And by its definition, modular forms on field, so if you take a quotient of two modular forms or sum or product, it will also be a modular function, but it will also a modular function. Okay. And we can also consider modular forms and modular functions for finite index subgroups of sl 2 z for instance, gamma zero n which is this one. So the subgroup of SL2Z where the lower corner thing is congruent to zero mod n. So <clears throat> now the S-duality uh, of uh, physics predicts some behavior here <clears throat> um, that uh, these generating function behaves in a nice way under modular transformations. In fact, uh, one can look at the so-called <laughs> Langlands dual partition function or the partition function for the Langlands dual group, um, which is, this. So we, we take the, the uh, proper written partition function from before, okay. and we sum it up over all W in the second cohomology modulo R times the second cohomology with the, this, in the sum we have the, this, uh, the power of the R root of unity W times C1, so the intersection product here. So this is, um, and obviously this only makes sense. It's implicit in this that and um, the waffle written partition function only depends on W modulo R, uh, R times the second cohomology. So this is the Langlands dual. <coughs> and uh, for this partition function, the, conje the conjecture of waffle written uh, says that uh, these two are related by uh, this element S in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the modular group SL2Z. So if I replace tau by minus one over tau in the waffle witten uh, partition function, I get up to some elementary factors and uh, this model, uh, this uh, transformation uh, factor, we get the one from the Langlands dual group. And so that's a rather uh, strong restriction for these things, a rather strong property. <clears throat> so um, if one looks at it carefully, one will see that this operation uh, exchanges the part of the partition function corresponding to the trivial partition R, so which corresponds to the order number of modular space of sheaves, and the one of the so-called vertic vertical uh, uh, component, where the partition is just one, 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 one. And uh, in addition, if for instance, R is a prime number, Thomas shows that <clears throat> this uh, uh, 
partition function for lambda will be zero unless lambda is the trivial partition R or one to the R, or the other ones are zero. So in particular, by S duality, if one believes in it, if R is the prime number, if I only compute, for instance, this vertical uh, buffer written partition function, so one to the R, this determines the whole what buffer with the partition function. In particular, it gives me the Euler numbers of the non-modelized basis of sheets. Okay, and now I want to uh, tell you what one gets for the vertical buffer Witten invariance. So I first recall the result of uh, Laraka, who gives us a structure formula for the vertical uh, buffer Witten invariance. So this goes, so I first recall to you some modular forms and so on. So we have the DFD the, uh, eta function, which is this infinite product. We have the discriminant, which is the eta function to the 24. This is a model of form of 12. And uh, here we consider the theta function, some theta functions for the AR lattice. So the AR lattice is just Z to the R with the intersection form, you know, on the standard basis, given by twos on the diagonal, minus one on the uh, things next to the diagonal on both sides, and otherwise zero. Um, <clears throat> and um, then we take, uh, if, all, if we put zero here, we have uh, for the L, then we have just sum over V to the uh, in Z to the R, Q to the one half VV. And in addition, we, com we consider some kind of shifts of it where we shift the element of V by some rational multiple of a, of a certain vector. <coughs> um, and this gives us uh, a number of theta functions here. Okay, so for the moment, we only use the one with zero, but uh, later we will see the others. So um, in addition, we need this notation. So everybody knows what delta B is, but in this case, it's slightly different. So if A and B are two elements in the second cohomology, then delta B is sent to be one if A minus B is divisible by R in the cohomology and it's zero otherwise. So it's kind of, okay. And now uh, there's this theorem of Laraka for the, the virtual uh, buffer Witten invariance. If you take the, so, if I fix the rank R, then we have some universal power series, C0, Cij, from I, J from one to R minus one, such that for all surfaces as H, with G0 and H1 as of Z equal to zero, we uh, have that this uh, vertical generating function is given in this form. So first we have something with the delta function to the pi of, uh, pi of S, then we have our theta function here, to the minus ks squared divided uh, uh, divide by eta of q minus ks. And then we have the, this unknown power series, c0 to the ks squared. Then we take here this delta. So we have the sum over all tuples beta, which are beta one to beta r minus one in uh, the second cohomology. We, this contribution is only non-zero if c1 is congruent to the sum of the beta i times beta i in the uh, uh, modulo uh, uh, R times uh, the second cohomology. We have here, we multiply by the product of the cyber witten invariance of the beta I, and we multiply by the product of the Cij to the power of the section numbers of these classes beta I. So this is this general formula. And this is proven, but with these unknown powers. And so just to, to remind to you, this SW of beta I is a cyber witten invariant, so this is a zyber witten variant associated to every uh, cohomology class in the second cohomology, an integer. And um, these uh, are in principle uh, are some C infinity invariants of four many mold folds, but if S is an algebraic surface, they are very easy to compute. And for instance, if S is a minimal, is minimal surface of general type, then we have only two classes for which the zyber witten invariants are non-zero, namely, for the zero class in the second cohomology and for the canonical class, where it's minus one to the chi of S. And uh, just uh, what I, I reiterate what I said before, this delta in the formulas comes from the fact that one can compute the invariance for a K3 surface. And for a K3 surface, only this term is there and all the other ones are zero because K is zero and there are no cyber Witten classes. <coughs> and, um, or whatever, I mean, and for, um, uh, and this theta function for the, this expression here with the theta function of the AR lattice comes because of the blow up formula. 
Um, and so <clears throat> in this expression here, in theorem of Laraka, we know the terms in the upper line. So we put this psi RSC1Q, uh, just the combination of the terms that we don't know and we want to know. So if we know the psi, we know the whole uh, vertical generating function. And so let's try to understand what the psi is. Um, so Can this you give is- you an idea how Laraka proves this? Yeah, um, well, obviously, uh, <laughs> yes, I know how one proves it. I mean, in some sense, uh, if I have time, which is kind of now maybe unlikely, it, I would kind of say it later, but I can briefly say, so one can somehow, you know, by uh, reducing the problem to, uh, you know, you see, here we are in the vertical part. So the, the sheaf is a direct sum of rank one sheaves. So in some sense, these are ideal sheaves of zero dimensional subschemes tensorized by a line bundle. So you can imagine this has something to do with Hilbert schemes of points. So you can eventually reduce the whole thing to um, an intersection number on a product of Hilbert schemes of points. Um, and then uh, one uses, uh, you know, this, somehow this old result of uh, uh, links with uh, Lane and me, um, that uh, intersection numbers uh, on Hilbert schemes of points in terms of some tautological sheaves can be expressed uh, as polynomials in the intersection numbers in the question. And <clears throat> if um, uh, they are nicely fit together, uh, then uh, you also get a product form. And all this is satisfied here. So one somehow reduces it to, to some uh, known facts on Hilbert schemes of points. But uh, obviously it requires a lot of work, but uh, you know, that's, uh, it, it follows eventually uh, from this uh, cobordism argument on the Hilbert scheme of points. I mean, if there's time, I can show you. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Now I wanted to show you the conjectural formulas uh, that I have until rank five. Uh, so for simplicity, that, you know, just so that the formulas look simpler, because in that case, uh, you know, the formulas depend on the zabek witten invariants, um, and uh, if we assume that S is minimal, minimal surface of general type, so that only uh, we only have these two uh, zabek witten classes, for which the zabek witten invariants are non-zero. So. Um, so now I again remind you of some of the things we had. I, I want to, I had these theta functions for the uh, ER lattice. I can look at the quotient of two of them. So the one for zero where I don't shift it and the one for L. This, uh, both of, you know, these two are both modular forms. So the quotient is a certain modular function. And here I can recall what they are. And I also recall you what this delta AB is. <coughs> And then with this, we can first look at the rank two case. Uh, in the rank two case, that's actually uh, more or less what Waffer Witten say. If you compute this phi, this is just, uh, it gives you one if C1 is congruent to zero, mod two, and it gives you minus one to the chi of S times the theta function if C1 is congruent to S mod twice the commod. So that's a rather simple. Uh, that's the, this formula in this case. Uh, and the rank, um, and this, this kind of statement follows essentially, uh, you know, if one believes that there is a, a simple formula, this would follow from the lower problem. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, some time ago with uh, Martin, we computed the rank three case, which is a bit more complicated. So again, if, uh, so <clears throat> it's again in terms of these theta functions now for the a2 lattice, it's always in terms of the theta function of the AR minus one lattice in rank R. Um, so we have, uh, here we take this, the, the quotient of these two theta functions uh, for one and for zero <coughs> to the KS squared times chi of S. Um, so this we have if C1 is equal to KS or to minus KS modulo three times uh, the second cohomology. And something more interesting happens when uh, C1 is congruent to zero because we get this new ingredient, these power series X plus and X minus. And uh, uh, again, to this power K squared. So in this case, we have to solve a quadratic equation. So as I told you, um, modular uh, functions are fields so where I can look at field extensions. And so I have uh, this uh, X plus and X minus are the solutions of this quadratic equations where the coefficients are again given by 
this quotient of theta functions. So that's um, that's this uh, the statement in rank three, and um, now in rank four it gets uh, oh, so just to say again, <clears throat> so these theta functions somehow just come from the law of formulas, but in already in the case of rank three the formula is more subtle by introducing this extra x plus and x minus. Now in rank four, uh, I the formula is somehow given in terms of Ramanujan's uh, octic continued fraction. So this is this u of q, root of two q to one eight one plus q divided by one plus. I mean you can see it. <clears throat> this actually also can be expressed in a simple way in terms of as a quotient of products of eta functions. In this expression, you can see it's also a modular function because an eta function is a modular uh, form of weight one half, and so it's a uh, weight three halves divided by three halves. So this is a modular function, but it has this nice. Uh, uh, continued fraction uh, decomposition. Uh, and uh, now the, the conjecture is a little bit more complicated than in the rank three case. But uh, so you can anyway see we um, now as ingredients have these, again, these theta functions uh, corresponding to the A3 lattice. I mean, the quotient of theta functions to the A3 lattice. Um, then we have this U in these formulas. And in addition, we have this Z, where Z and Z, Z to the minus one are the roots of this quadratic equation. So we are in this uh, extension of, uh, uh, again, um, and you can see it, it looks kind of, uh, in some sense has some nice symmetries also. So if C1 is congruent to zero modulo, the second, uh, the uh, four times uh, the second cohomology, then uh, you have this term z to z to minus one divided by this to the ks squared. And you have then again, the same term to the ks squared will replace z by z to the minus one. If uh, c1 is congruent to uh, two ks, then you essentially get the same where now maybe u is replaced by u to the minus one and something slightly different happens. And if c1 is congruent to ks or minus ks, the formula looks a bit simpler. You don't need the z anymore, but you only have the uh, this u uh, u of q squared or u of q squared to minus one. So these two are related by putting uh, u of, q of q to u of q squared to u of q squared to the minus one. So this is this formula, uh, and um, ah, now I got stuck. How does one get rid of this? Ah, okay. And now we finally, I want to tell you about uh, rank five. So this is now in terms of this, the famous uh, Rogers Amanuyan continued fraction. So we have Q to the one fifth divided by one plus Q divided by something. And the something is of the form one plus Q squared divided by something. And that's of the form one plus Q to the three divided by something and so on. And uh, <clears throat> uh, this now is a, rather non-trivial fact also has a product decomposition like this. <coughs> I think that's uh, 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 <coughs> maybe the Roger, uh, the Rogers Ramanujan identities. And one can also prove, it's also I think not uh, totally obvious that if I take r to the minus five, minus 11, minus r, r to the five, this is just this quotient of eta function. Eta of q divided by eta q to the five to the six. Okay. And now in terms, of, and I also introduce two auxiliary functions, this beta one, which is something with these, uh, again, our theta function, and then an expression, something three times r to the minus five plus two minus eight times r to the five. And then the beta two is the same where I place here the theta function with one to that with two and replace r by r to the minus one. And then I get this conjecture. We have again this um, contributions when C1 is congruent to zero to Ks minus Ks, two Ks or minus two Ks. And um, here you can see these functions I had, the beta i, um, the, uh, and, uh, but we also have some unknown ones. We have Z, X plus, X plus minus, Y plus minus. So these are, we don't know where, where they are, but in terms of these, we have this expression. Um, and now these are the solutions of uh, three quadratic equations. <clears throat> so X plus minus 
y plus minus. So here we have the equation for x, which is in terms of the beta one, the theta portion of theta functions for one, and then like this, the beta for one. And then we have this, we have the y where we have somehow replaced uh, one with two and r with r to the minus one. And then we have the last one for z, which looks very similar to what we had in rank three and rank four to the x equation. So this is the final conjecture. So for this rank four case. Okay, so this uh, is what one gets. Sorry, um, Lothar. There is a, sorry Lothar. Uh, there is a question in the Q&A. Is there some intuition for this higher rank formula? Intuition? intuition behind the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, not, I mean, so because of all this uh, s duality stuff, obviously we expect to have some modular functions. And so, uh, what we it's actually there's not so much intuition so what we do and if i had the time i would uh, explain how we do it is we compute these um, uh, this generating function up to a certain order in q so basically up to uh, up, up to the 12th order in q so that means we know all these functions up to order uh, up to q to the 12th and then you know, uh, then we just play with them until we find some relations among them and some relations uh, to uh, known uh, modular uh, forms and functions. And this is what we come up with. So, uh, but it is, you know, by itself, we kind of believe we have modular forms and we can see from the rank three case, it's not as simple as one might hope. So we are willing to solve some uh, some equations and do kind of things but otherwise i mean i don't think there's you know you just look at these and you try to find relations between them until everything is determined and that's what we did here so um but i i don't have a deep reason why the formula has to look like that but you know it a lot of effort went into it and also a lot of effort went into writing it as simple as possible regardless of how it looks <laughs> you know i mean you can write the same formulas in a much, you, you, I think it, it's no difficulty to write the same thing on, on, on three slides. Uh, if you, uh, you know, it's just, this is the best way we could do it. Okay. So we also, so in all these cases, uh, the, these unknown functions C0 and Cij, so uh, are modular functions in a finite uh, algebraic extension of the field of modular functions for gamma zero R. We also have some partial results of rank, for rank six and seven, uh, you know, expressing uh, things there again in terms of uh, these theta functions, uh, so-called half module for uh, gamma zero R. So anyway, this uh, we have to see. Now I want to also, <clears throat> And now I want to briefly, um, how much time do I? Oh, okay. I briefly talk also about the horizontal of a written invariants, which are just the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, just the, Euler, the virtual order numbers of the modular space of sheets. So we, uh, I started uh, by this uh, structure formula of uh, uh, Lahaka for the vertical of a written invariants. He actually proved it. Uh, we are not able to prove uh, the structure formula, but we give a conjecture for it. And then uh, using this conjecture, uh, we can uh, determine, uh, you know, uh, again, until rank five, uh, the generating function for the virtual order numbers of the modular spaces of sheaves on uh, uh, any uh, surface with BG bigger than zero and H1 equal to zero. So uh, let's see. So now somehow, there's some kind of duality between uh, the, the one with one to the R, so the vertical and the horizontal case. So it's maybe not so surprising that, we, that instead of looking for the theta function for the AR lattice, we look at the theta function for the, the dual lattice of the AR lattice. So the dual lattice of the R lattice is just Z to the R with the by linear pairing like this, where, which where now the intersection matrix is the inverse of the matrix for the AR lattice. And then we write down a very, so if L equal to zero, uh, we again write just sum of all V, Q of this one half the intersection of the thing with itself. But we also have some shift with L and Z, 
when now we don't shift the argument here, but we put a sign or a root of unity depending on the multiple of L. And then again, we consider the quotient of two such things and call it TL uh, dual. And again, such a thing is always a modular form. The quotient is always a modular function. So we have, have these. <coughs> And now uh, we have this conjecture, which gives a very similar uh, structure to, uh, to that of Laraka. So for in any rank, we have, again, as many universal power series, D0, Dij, such that for any surface, um, uh, you know, with this assumption, Pg bigger than zero and so on, the virtual order number of the modular space is the coefficient of Q to the basically Q to the one over two R times the virtual dimension of the modular space. We have this term here, which will make the whole thing modular of this expression here. So we have a trivial prefactor. We have something with the delta function to the chi of S. We have something which looks very similar to what we had for the horizontal, for the vertical invariance to the minus KS squared, uh, only now with the dual theta function. And then we have the same expression as before with this D power series instead of with the uh, C power series. Again, summing over beta, uh, tuples beta in the second cohomology with the sour quitting classes. But instead of having this delta of, the, uh, of, of C1 with the sum of the uh, I beta I, we take uh, an rth root of unity uh, to the power of this and sum them up. Okay, so this is some kind of, I mean, maybe some kind of Fourier transform or whatever. And then we multiply by uh, dij to the power beta i beta j. <clears throat> so this is uh, the conjecture. <clears throat> and then again, as in the uh, other case, we, uh, we take out the part which, is, which we don't know. Um, this uh, just the lower line here. So these are power series which have explicitly given, this is just a number. And so this uh, d0, this is kind of the part we need to know to know the whole uh, generating function of all the order numbers of all the modular spaces. Okay, and so uh, now we have a. So now we want to, one wants to determine this via S duality. And so what uh, uh, we found is that the S duality, you know, of that Waffer Witten say is equivalent under this previous conjecture to the statement that D0 is related to zero by a modular transformation and Dij is related to Cij by a modular transformation. And somehow, in some sense, in the simplest possible way, namely the statement is if we put again Q equal to two pi i tau, tau in the complex upper half plane, then D0 is just C0 at minus one over tau and Dij of tau, tau is just Cij at minus one over tau, okay? So this is the conjecture it fits with all the things we have <clears throat> because we have in, in some low cases computed uh, and we have also computed in some cases the other side. And so given this, we can, um, we can now uh, compute, we can use the result we have for the vertical vertical invariance to give us the horizontal one. This is now, because of this uh, S2-Rity transformation, there's a simple dictionary how you translate uh, the formula for the vertical waffer witten invariance in a formula for the order numbers of the modular spaces. And this goes as follows. So this is, so Psi, we call this generating function. And then we have the following. So we assume this conjecture holds, then this generating function for corresponding to the virtual order numbers is obtained from the one for the vertical waffer witten invariance by replacing first this delta C1 LKS by the rth root of unity to the, to the LKS times C1, okay? And this is really some kind of, uh, you know, almost Fourier transform that you do this. Then uh, we, this, the, the quotient of theta functions uh, with respect to the R minus one lattice is replaced by the corresponding one for the dual lattice. And then finally, so this works uh, like this. It already gives us uh, what we have in rank two and three because these are the only ingredients that one had in rank two and three. In rank four, we had this U. And so we replace, in all the formulas, u of q squared by this expression in this uh, rational, this portion, uh, this product uh, of uh, eta functions, which is uh, again a modular function. And finally, in case, uh, in the case of rank five, we replace r of q, so the Roger Ramanujan's uh, 
um, uh, continued fraction by this rational function in R of Q. Namely, we take min one minus phi times R of Q divided by phi plus R of Q, where phi is the golden ratio, one plus square root of five over two. And so this gives us the formula for uh, the Euler numbers of the modelized spaces up to rank five. Uh, uh, <clears throat> for, I mean, the virtual on numbers uh, for whenever PG is bigger than zero and H1 is equal uh, to zero. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, obviously, you know, much of this uh, was conjecture. Maybe now I should uh, say uh, how much time do I have? I have uh, 10 minutes. So I can maybe say, uh, try to say a few words about um, how uh, how one goes about doing this. I hinted at it before. So this is about the computation of these virtual invariants. So we go back to uh, the definition of this buffer written uh, to the fixed point of the buffer written uh, modelized space. So we have, uh, um, so, so this parameterizes uh, direct sums of rank one sheaves and the phi will always send the map from EI to EI minus one tensor KS. Um, so we can take, as I said, EI to be an ideal sheaf of a zero dimensional scheme tensor line bundle. So SNI is the Hilbert scheme of NI points on S, LI is a line bundle. And um, obviously, if this Higgs sheaf, if, if this is supposed, this is a non zero map. So if this exists, we must have that. Um, um, that this uh, tensor product is effective. So there is a section of it. Okay. So <clears throat> we can put this together to something. So if n is an uh, r minus one tuple of positive integers, beta is a tuple of classes in the second cohomology, all of which are effective. We can take this product of Hilbert schemes denoted like this. We take the product of the linear systems corresponding to these classes. So beta is the, the tuple of the beta i, we call it beta like this. And we can look at the so-called nested Hilbert scheme, which is a set of all r tuples of uh, uh, subschemes and uh, Curve classes uh, r minus one, so that i z i of minus c one is equal to is contained in the idea of c i minus one, and this this incidence variety will be a, a subscheme of the product of the Hilbert scheme and the product of the linear systems, and um, by what I just say said, uh, it, it is uh, uh, at least believable that uh, the union of the of these uh, uh, fixed point loci corresponding to the partition one to the R is isomorphic to a union of certain of these nested Hilbert schemes. So we can, instead of, uh, we can work on these nested Hilbert schemes. There's a way how one can decide which nested Hilbert schemes occur. I mean, we will not go into detail. We have this quadratic form applying to the classes AI, which are basically the classes of these beta I's. And there is a precise condition when uh, uh, this uh, nested Hilbert scheme will uh, be uh, isomorphic, will, will, will correspond to uh, a component. Uh, so this is one to the R, uh, this is one to the R, not R, corresponds to, uh, uh, to this part of the, uh, of the uh, Ruffer Witten model. I, think. So, I mean, I don't go into detail here. So only this N like this means the sum, so N is a tuple of non-negative integers and n in brackets like is, is this sum of these integers. And then we have this expression. It doesn't, maybe it's a, I don't, you anyway can't take it in, in this detail. There's just some explicit form. And now <clears throat> Golam, Poo and Thomas define a virtual fundamental class on this nested Hilbert scheme, which coincides with the one one gets uh, if one does a virtual localization on you know, that one gets on the fixed point loci if one does uh, when one does this local uh, virtual localization to define uh, the invariance uh, the buffer Witten invariance, and I kind of try to very briefly say what this is. It doesn't matter very much. We have here the, the pullbacks of the ideal sheaves of the universal sub schemes, and then in terms of this, uh, so when one takes the virtual fundamental class 
of this nested Hilbert scheme, one can look at its push forward to the product of the product of Hilbert schemes on the linear systems. And this is given by product, uh, you know, you have the cyber product of cyber written classes and you have a certain uh, integral related to essentially ideal sheaves of universal sheaves or morphisms between them um, and uh, somehow total bundles on, on these linear systems and you intersect it with a class uh, of the Hilbert scheme and the, you know, the point class so corresponding to line one line bundle each in the product of linear systems, just an explicit formula. It doesn't matter precisely what it is, but you have an explicit formula like this, which where you also see where the zyber witten invariants come from. <clears throat> and uh, so this also, you know, this formula also plays a role in, in Laraka's uh, proof. Uh, no, I'm... <laughs> Close the door. Um, um, so um, then... Um, Okay, the, so you know in Laraka's formula, the world, so this is also how Laraka proves his formula. And uh, you can see how the zyber witten invariants, for instance, come. And um, then <clears throat> if beta is effect, so now I, one has to, <clears throat> so this gives us the fundamental class, and now we have to see what to integrate over it. So if one does this virtual localization, one has to uh, integrate one over the, uh, Euler, the equivalent Euler class of the virtual normal bundle. <clears throat> and so we have to say, what is the virtual normal bundle? And this one does in terms of somehow the universal sheet. So for every beta, we consider some line bundles such that K minus beta I is equal to the difference of these line bundles. And this is this. <clears throat> and the, the sum of the first joint classes are the, our given C1. And then we get some line bundles on the product of S and the Hilbert scheme and the product of the linear systems, just taking the tensor product of these line bundles and then the tensor product of tautological O of one bundles on these linear systems. And we use all this data to make a sheaf. So the universal ideal sheaf tensor these line bundles, tensor T to the minus one, where T is the uh, equivalent character of the action uh, corresponding uh, to the C star action. And you can see, if you look at this E, the I corresponds to the ideal sheaf of a zero dimensional subscheme. The L corresponds to our line bundle. And, uh, and so you can see, where is it? This uh, corresponds precisely to the fact that, that E is the sum of the AI and the AI look like this. Okay, so this is how it comes to pass. And now, uh, you know, <clears throat> as because we have this O of one here, there is a tautological, uh, there will be a tautological map here, and this uh, gives us an equivalent Higgs pair on the whole of uh, of S n times uh, uh, S times S n times the product of the beta. And so one can define the one can compute the virtual uh, <coughs> uh, tangent bundle in terms of this. <coughs> so the the contribution of the as I said the contribution of this. Uh, uh, how's it called the uh, uh, <clears throat> nested Hilbert scheme to uh, the invariant is uh, given by this uh, integral over the virtual fundamental class of one over the Euler number of the virtual normal bundle. Um, and the tangent bundle can explicitly be computed uh, in terms of this universal sheaf like this. By, I mean, it doesn't matter precisely what the formula is. You have a relatively simple, I mean, you have a formula that you can evaluate. It. <clears throat> and so it doesn't matter precisely what it is, but you can see that we have an explicit formula for the virtual fundamental class. Uh, and we have an explicit formula for the tangent bundle, and we are supposed to compute this virtual order number. So everything is given to us. Um, and if one looks at it, this stuff is given in terms of universal ideal sheaves and tautological bundles on Hilbert schemes. So these are all things which are, you know, have been studied, uh, which one can work with. And so if one puts it all together, one gets uh, uh, that this generating function for the vertical uh, buffer Witten invariance is a generating function like this, where the strange quadratic form Q that we had comes here and uh, the sum of the NI comes here. And otherwise, it all looks like this. The Zabakritten class come from what we had in the uh, 
in the formula for the virtual fundamental class. <clears throat> and then we have some expression, uh, whatever, upsilon of, uh, of the A, uh, the N, and the T, which uh, kind of uh, gives us uh, the whole expression that we get if we want to compute uh, uh, the, to some, some, the virtual fundamental class and the portrait of the virtual fundamental class and the, the class, uh, the churn the classes of the uh, virtual tangent bundle. And the, but one can explicitly say what this is, but it's a very complicated expression. So it's, you get an explicit equivalent class on this product of Hilbert schemes of points. We can compute what the constant term is and we can divide by it. So we divide, we take the generating function after we divide by the constant term. And this is some nice power series. So as I said, uh, the thing that we integrate over the Hilbert scheme of points um, is an, a universal expression in terms of churn classes of tautological sheaves, universal ideal sheaves, and these classes AI, you know, the AI of which, which are the components of this A. And then uh, there's this general cobordism invariant story, which, uh, which says, <clears throat> which uh, I mean, we proved many years ago, uh, that if, whenever you have to integrate such a thing over the Hilbert scheme, it can be expressed by universal formula by the intersection numbers, which are in question. So the, the intersection numbers which occur here are chi of OS, the self intersection of the KS squared, the intersection of the AI with KS and the product of the AI AJ. So this integral is a universal polynomial in this stuff, or rather it's a power, it's a whatever a power series in T whose coefficients are, are universal polynomials in this. And so, um, okay, so that we know. On the other hand, we can also see if we take um, if our surface would be the disjoint union of uh, two surfaces, uh, then if we take this product of Hilbert schemes of it, this will actually be the product over all ways, um, uh, uh, over all ways of writing our uh, vector of numbers as a sum of two such vectors of the product of the corresponding product of Hilbert schemes uh, over the factors. And if one and works this out, what it means for this integral, it means that actually this function G that we want to compute here is just, to, you know, if we have S is a disjoint union of surfaces and this A, you know, this were, was, a, was a, a tuple of line bundles or of cohomology classes, so that A is just A1 on S1 and A2 on S2, then the whole expression will just be the product. And now if I have these two statements, for one thing, the expression is given by polynomials in intersection numbers. And second, it's a product. If uh, we do like this, then it follows formally from this by uh, uh, the way how such uh, numbers can work, that there is a product formula for this in terms of some universal power series. There's a simple argument which proves this, that you can write it like this. And now, our so uh, <clears throat> this is for instance, the proof of, uh, this gives the proof of Laraka's uh, result, but it also allows us to compute these terms now, because now we want to compute this in order to determine all these power series, we need to be able to compute this uh, GSA for sufficiently, for the correct number of tuples of a surface and uh, a tuple of uh, class in the second cohomology on it. And we take these surface to be toric surfaces and uh, these classes to be the classes of toric line bundles. Uh, and we do it in such a way that these tuples of all these numbers are linearly independent. So if we can determine GSA for all of these, we know, we know all these power series. But now we have, a, we have a toric surface, a toric line bundle, so we can use equivalent localization to compute. So these, uh, Hilbert's, these two products of Hilbert schemes of points have a C star action with finitely many fixed points. These fixed points are parameterized by tuples of partitions. Um, no, because uh, yeah. a subscheme concentrated in a point which is invariant under the C star action is one uh, uh, which is generated by monomials in terms of local equivalent coordinates, <clears throat> and uh, these are parameterized by partitions. So we get uh, the fixed points are parameterized by tuples of partitions. 
and um, everything is given in terms of some universal sheets on it. So then the contribution at each fixed point, if one does uh, uses the localization formula for this, uh, I mean, a tier bot localization at these fixed points, is given just by some combinatorial expression in terms of the data of the partitions. And now, if one is uh, very smart, one could uh, try to understand uh, <coughs> this in terms of symmetric functions as we are not, we instead write a, a program. <coughs> so I, I write a program to compute uh, uh, this up to uh, uh, Q to the uh, 12 to compute all these things up to degree uh, 12. And uh, with this, we know all these power series, therefore everything is degree. Okay, and then finally, as I said, in order to get uh, uh, our, uh, the formulas ahead before, now we, we kind of stare at this power series we have gotten and we play with them and we try to find some relations between them until we find enough so that everything is determined and we get our formulas. And uh, so we have therefore these conjectures, but we have also proven them uh, you know, up to a certain dimension. So for all moduli spaces up to a certain expected dimension, this conjecture is, uh, you know, we have come to the conjecture by proving it up to, uh, I mean, for many examples. Okay. Or, you know, or just for, in some sense, for any surface up to a certain expected dimension of the moduli space. Okay, maybe that's all I wanted to say. I'm sorry I went slightly over, but um, okay. Questions? So what kind of structure do you expect uh, in general? So in the most optimistic... Uh, <laughs> well, um, you know, in some sense, <clears throat> well, it's not so clear. You know, if you look at, uh, at these formulas here, um, I mean, the first thing is, I mean, there is a certain I mean, maybe the five is a bit bad, but um, there is a certain structure, you know, uh, but uh, it gets each time a bit more complicated. I mean, if one was very optimistic, one would say, okay, we we do something with these uh, uh, with these theta functions. We have to add some other modular form, and then we have to solve some quadratic equation in, in modular functions. But I don't know whether it's as simple as, as that or not. Um, you know, in the moment. You know, it's you know, as uh, uh, one question said, uh, this is not based on some on very much intuition. You no, know, we we have uh, found a way to you know compute uh, up to a certain degree and match the data with some uh, explicit model expressions, but they are a little bit complicated, uh, and so uh, I don't know precisely what more to expect. But I mean, what I can certainly say is that one would always have such an expression like here, where you have. Uh, um, the, you know, the sum over the delta, so delta C1 and L times K for K from, uh, you know, all the poss possibilities from uh, uh, whatever zero to R, <coughs> uh, of to R minus one, and then you get uh, something to the power KS squared. Uh, and uh, then you have this chaos OS here. And, and I mean, I can say a little bit more, but um, yeah. But you know what these functions are uh, is not so clear. Uh, I mean, you should always get some modular functions, and they should be in some relatively small extension of gamma zero n. And you might always find a formula in terms of the Hauptmodule or something. But you know, I'm not sure. Uh, you know what precisely to expect. Maybe it was a long answer to say nothing. But anyway, okay. <laughs> But if you sum over all the partitions, then you expect kind of this algebraic dependence to drop out, or um, partition function, you sum up over all the partitions lambda. Or, or, um, in what sense? Which algebraic dependence on? Uh, you, not, you don't get a modular form; you get an extension, algebraic extension of a modular function, or. Um, but um, you now let me try to understand. I mean, so you know, if you look, for instance, at this case, you know, you have these two contributions: the one for um, uh, for R 
so you have the contribution for uh, for for the uh, for the trivial partition R and for the uh, for one to the R. And these are kind of independent summons. They don't really mix. No, you just sum both of them. It's only that under uh, S duality they are interchanged. But I don't know. And the whole expression is modular. That's true. So okay. So so that is obviously you know this is actually in some sense you are right. So you have all these terms are modular for some subgroup, but when you uh, sum them all up, uh, they get permuted in such a way that the whole expression is somehow modular for, uh, uh, in some sense, essential. Well, uh, for maybe for actually I think for uh, gamma zero r. So in that you're right, but. Uh, Still, if one can only compute one side, uh, then it's always one computes one and the other is determined by that so that the whole thing becomes modular. I don't know whether that helps. <laughs> you know, there, you know, the whole thing is modular, but it has so many terms and, you know, it's not, uh, and you know, the modular also involves uh, this kind of free transform. I mean, so it's not uh, completely clear to me how this gives us a, uh, but maybe we can discuss at some point, but I, in the moment, don't have a clear idea what I expect. Do you expect some uh, fox space to be behind this story? So to see these visors above expectations of some operators? Okay, now that is, um, well, in some, I mean, whether it's just the fox space, that's a little bit, uh, but one would expect there is something like that. Obviously, in the case of Hilbert schemes, which is the, the rank uh, one case, that is precisely the case. And um, so one could expect that there is some kind of uh, uh, Lie algebra like that, but it must be, you know, a little bit more, uh, more complicated. No, it's not just a fox space. And um, it, you know, it also maybe cannot, you know, it's not, you know, yeah, there, I expect there will be something like this, some vertex algebra or whatever, which is responsible for this, but I don't see uh, now how, uh, you know, how this will be the case, but there's something should be the case, but uh, I don't know how, so. Uh, sorry, more questions? <laughs> So is there some hope for this 2-2 two, two partition? I mean, the rank 4-2-2 two, two partition? Uh, yeah, I, we haven't thought about it. I once uh, mentioned it to, um, to Martin and he explained to me why it was not so easy. So uh, it's a little bit complicated. Obviously you could say in first approximation, you're looking at a uh, product of two modular spaces of sheaves of rank two, and then you do something similar to what we did with products of Hilbert schemes with that. But there are many complications because the stability doesn't quite match and so on. So it should be somehow possible, but I expect one would have to maybe do something with uh, some stability conditions. I mean, maybe in some, you know, use some kind of maybe, I don't know, maybe some wall crossing in derived categories or whatever to, you know, because it, it doesn't quite match on the nose that these are just, uh, you know, you, you cannot just say you take one modelized space, touch the other modelized space, you integrate over it. It's somehow different, but uh, somehow it's clear what one would like to do. And then one would have to find out how to uh, correct it into something which actually is right. And uh, in the moment I can't know how. But certainly it should be possible in some way, but uh, okay. Uh, we haven't seen we, have uh, we have a question in the chat. Is anything known or expected about the contribution of the 2-2 two -two component in rank four? Well, this was just asked, no? <laughs> and, yes. I mean, uh, the thing I'm is we haven't, we, <laughs> we haven't done the computation because uh, uh, we don't know how to do it. In, and in particular, we, we didn't produce a prediction. Um, I mean, I think it is, well, let me see. I don't think so. I'm pretty sure it, uh, I mean, I, I would have to check, but I, I think it doesn't follow from s duality. I mean, uh, there might be some restrictions coming from s duality, but otherwise, um, uh, it's it's not it, you can't just deduce it from the uh, from the vertical partition function, and we don't know very well how to compute it because uh, 
Um, in first approximation, as I said, it's done by integrating over products of modelized basis of rank two sheaves, but it's not quite true. And we don't really know how to, uh, uh, how to make it work. You have a question? Uh, in the theorem of Lala curve, so there was some exponents of k squared and also negative k squared. So uh, if we just multiply the same thing on, under the under such exponents, then it's yeah. still true. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. So uh, obviously, this is actually uh, I, I should have said it. Obviously, that we have this term here with minus k squared is just our convention. The point is, you know, obviously we could absorb the term with minus k squared into the term with a c0. We don't do this because um, this is uh, this term is the one which comes from the blow-up formula. So kind of the interesting, you know, so we somehow expect that we get a simpler formula for the c0 or, uh, you know, something that we can understand better uh, if we uh, uh, just pull this term out. Because this term, we know that this has to be there in some form. We could have absorbed it into this, but it somehow kind of, makes the formula less clean if one doesn't pull it out. So we only want to keep the term that the part that we don't know. But if we wanted, we could multiply these two out and this would still, you know, it's, it's not a theorem that, you know, obviously there's no problem multiplying these two and it's still something to the power k squared. That's true. It's just uh, so that we get a, a simpler formula for C0. Thank you. more questions? All right, if not, let's thank Kotar again.